it's not a new approach, but a, a new product on the market for restoring the natural outflow. And it is an exciting one. You're doing a lot of these procedures. You will show us in the morning uh, exciting videos. I've done a couple of procedures, though that's why there is only one video. <laughs> what do you think about canaloplasty? And especially, so I started with our external techniques. So, and what I learned from Robert Stakeman was uh, a very, very important thing, early intervention. And that is what we're addressing with canaloplasty with the iTrick Advance. And I, I like it so much. What is your impression about natural outflow, restoring natural outflow, about the technique, addressing it? Very good points. Well, thank you again. And thank you everybody for coming out. I appreciate that. Uh, it, is, it is very true. You know, my big passion has been to understand mechanism of action. Really, how are we addressing the mechanism of increased pressure? What we don't know, what has really bothered me for so many years, is when we look at a gonial prism, we look at the angle, we see a beautiful TM, it's an open, narrow, it's a PES. That's all we know of the outflow system. So preoperatively, we don't know. We'll talk a little about you know, some slides about where the resistance is located. Is it the trabecular meshwork? Is it the canal that's collapsed? Are the episcular venous system and the ostea collapsed? We don't know preoperatively. And so what I love about canaloplasty is call it comprehensive approach, right? Opening up the entire outflow system from trabecular meshwork to the canal all the way to the distal collector channels as well in the most physiologic way possible, which is why I'm a big fan of first line SLT. You know, I, I think we see compliance now also going back even further, even regardless of the surgery, we see that the impact of compliance is real. It is hard for our patients to take medications every day, to stay on those medications, the side effect profile, ocular surface disease, inflammation, fluctuating IOP potential, all those risk factors we now can address earlier and address the entire outflow system in a very safe fashion that is the most minimally invasive way that still allows us opportunities to do stenting, cutting later on, or subcon surgery as well. So it gives us a comprehensive approach in earlier disease. Number two, I think to your point, why is it important to treat earlier than later? Think about it this way. It sounds so simple, but I keep reminding myself, if we are constantly using aqueous suppressants, PGAs that divert fluid away from the trabecular meshwork, what is happening to the outflow system? Your Talk about that. Your is only young ones. So talk so, about that. And, uh, yeah, so what we know is the outflow resistance is due to higher resistance in trabecular meshwork. But you are absolutely right. If the patient takes drops over decades, we know today that there is not only a change in the trabecular meshwork, but Schlimm's canal as well. And there is a distal outflow which will be compromised by these ongoing inflammation. And that means at the end of the day that such a safe and effective approach could fail in late onset glaucoma. So that's why it's so important to address these patients early. And if we attend a surgical approach much earlier than today, though this procedure should not only effective, but safe. Safety is so important. And you pointed it out. So uh, we can do an additional procedures after canaloplasty, stenting, cutting the trabecular meshwork. So we have always a plan B because we know we can't heal at the moment glaucoma or we can treat it very, very well. So maybe we should have a look on the presentations about the outflow, outflow mechanisms, about their resistance in, in trabecular meshwork. We know about 75% of the natural outflow resistance in glaucoma patients are mostly affected due to trabecular meshwork. But you told us already, so. Schlem's canal, it's not an open tube, especially in glaucoma patients. There are some stricture, there is a collapse in higher pressure. We see herniation of the collector channels. And I love the idea to treat all of these com components in one surgical approach. Totally agree. And you know, I have had some patients who've had traditional canaloplasty many years ago, external, and then the ab internal approach for many, many years before we had the advance, as you mentioned. I think that when we talk about target pressure, now we saw data from Mark Gallardo and Mamu Kiyami and others have shown us that we're getting down to the middle teens, right, with this procedure, and we're getting down to less medications, 40, 50, 60% less medications. So that target pressure in middle teens, that mild to moderate patient, is actually where we want to be at. So the earlier we intervene, the better chance we have of attaining the target pressure because our target pressures are higher when you have earlier disease. And it's also important to recognize, oops, it's also important to recognize that when you address it earlier, 
we find that we have a better chance of stabilizing it and being okay with those pressures in the middle to upper teens. It's always the hardest thing in the world to say, oh my gosh, now the patient's worse, feels have gotten worse, now I have the pressure of target of 10 or 12. So an That's earlier hard. intervention often leads a longer duration Strong of the effect. effect. Yeah, talk about that. That is very, very important to point out. So if you treat a completely destroyed trabecular mesh, it would affect for a couple of years. But with these, we have often a very long lasting effect. And I remembering my of external canaloplasties, a lot of them are, are stable over 10, 15 years. And so uh, it is a little bit different, this approach. We will talk about the differences. Uh, we will uh, point it out in the morning. But I see a good chance if we treat early enough to have equal results with these of internal approach. And it's much faster and uh, so elegant. I love the procedure with this new device. And I really think it's, it's so important to recognize that we are, in my opinion, we are truly changing the natural course of the disease process. The pathology of glaucoma, as we talk about here, whether it's trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, or the distal collector channels, when you establish flow through the system early on, that natural flow is gonna keep it open. And so regardless of how good the pressures are with drops or surgery, when you have this type of surgery, despite, let's say, the same magnitude of, a, of reduction of IOP, drops versus this, I do believe strongly, and our own data shows this, that we are, to your point, we are keeping it more stable and by improving flow, preventing further collapse down the road. So that's why long-term disease, glaucoma is not a one-year, two-year disease. It's a 5, 10, 15, 20-year disease. And that's how we have to think about that journey for the patient. So, Carson, talk about this in terms of where, we, where the resistance is. You know, the Schlumps Canal, the Trebek, the Meshwork, and Episcopal has been the system, the collector channels as well. Talk about this again, we mentioned earlier, but kind of go through this if you don't mind. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So we, we know that the major location of resistance is Trebek, the Meshwork, but it's not alone. And especially in patients... Uh, of a longer history with glaucoma, we know there are secondary changes within Schlem's canal. There are strictures. There is a, um, a less permeability in the Schlem's canal itself. And um, there are tissue bridges in. So, and then next collect the channels. Uh, and we see it, especially if we do a proper canaloplasty up internal, that we are able to open these at the end of the surgery and we will see it, I think, in your videos as well, this blanching effect or this segmentation, how powerful the opening of collector channels is in allowing a very good outflow. And the results are so, it is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most effective mixed procedures. The pressure usually, and I don't achieve it with any stenting procedure or cutting procedure alone, is about 10 to 12, day one, day two. And that is impressive. And that shows me the potential of restoring not only one part of the natural outflow, but the whole one, as you pointed out already. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, hedging, we're hedging our bets uh, by addressing all the points of resistance as well. And I think it's interesting when you do, when you see these videos, what I've, what canaloplasty has taught me, first of all, anybody show of hands, how many people have done some type of canaloplasty already in your careers so far? Anybody yet? Okay. When you do it, it's the coolest thing in the world. Why? Because I, I remember, seriously, I remember, and I saw this blinking, you see the blinking red light with a canal plastic catheter, right? And you see all of a sudden, you're like, wait, there really is a canal, first of all. So all the things we learned about in school are real. But then, you, as you mentioned, segmental. When you talk about blanching, we see what we see, there's areas where there's significant blanching and some are not. And so we just don't know, and every patient is so different, of where the collector channels are located. We think it's in nasally or inferior nasally for a lot of our patients, but in some patients, it is temporal or superiorly as well. So having that kind of larger area that we could actually access and, and address really does hedge our bets as well. So let's, let's talk about that. And that's why it makes sense to address 360 degrees. Exactly. That is, so we, we have all seen the picture in the, in the anatomical books, but with this procedure, you can see it live on the patient, how natural outflow works and why it makes sense to improve natural outflow to treat glaucoma. Exactly. And, and in the U.S., I know every, every country is different. I, I've used this canal plasty as my base. So I'll do a canal plasty and then I'll do some other procedure on top of that, right? So I'll do this and I'll put a stent in there. I'll do a combined. Let's say someone's on three or four medications. Now, of course, cost is an issue. Access is an issue. But I think as a baseline appreciation of kind of hoping, helping the outflow system, I'll do this first and then do my stenting. Or even doing, cut, point, or even doing cutting, too. Yeah. What do you think? So a pushback I get from colleagues is, well, why don't we just do a GAT? 
which is a great procedure for some patients. Why don't we just do a GAT and not even do canaloplasty? What's the benefit of doing canaloplasty and then doing a cutting if you have to? Talk about that. Yeah, so uh, first of all, only cutting the trabeculum meshwork. So uh, if we use an oil for something else, mostly causes a damage of the outer wall of Schlem's canal and again affects collector channels. So and with this procedure, very good point, you can combine canaloplasty with a goniotomy and an atraumatic goniotomy, which prevents a damage of the distal outflow pathway. So and I love to do these as a combined procedure, especially in younger patients, because we know a goniotomy combined procedure works very, very good and long lasting in younger patients due to the higher elasticity of the trabecular meshwork. So once again, good point, we can combine. So we can add on these canaloplasty alone procedure, a very or high effective cutting procedure with good results and with less damage to the distal outflow. Very good points, Carson. And I think when you just, when you think about it, when we use this catheter, and we'll show you videos, of course, when we have the catheter that's going in the canal, it's breaking those herniations within the Schlem's canal, but it's a closed system, right? Your anterior chamber has pressure in it, pushing against the wall, the TM's closed, and you have the outer wall of Schlem's canal. So when you're viscodilating, you'll see in some videos though, we are pushing that viscoelastic into the episcovenous system. If you do a cutting only, there's no closed system there that the, the viscoelastic has a hard time getting into the episcovenous system as well, which is why it's good to do it in a closed system first, viscodilate, so you can push that into the episcovenous system, the viscoelastic, and then you can do a cutting as well. So you have a combination of both of those, giving you full appreciation of the outflow as well. So this is what it is, basically catheterization, so we take this beautiful blinking catheter, has a little red light, and I have, I have some videos online too showing how that saved me on multiple occasions. In fact, this Wednesday, Joe came to my office and it helped me understand kind of where the resistance was. But that blinking light tells you exactly where you are within the canal. If it's going to an offshoot, if it's going to supercellular space, you know exactly where you are at all times. And then the second step, once we intubate and break those herniations within the Schlem's canal, then on the way back, we can use this other part of the device to turn. So your technician is going click, turn, turn. And we're injecting almost three microliters per turn. So within a clock hour, we can do like almost 10 microliters within a clock hour to really viscodilate with pressure. Talk about that part of it, the viscodilation and the force and the amount that we're pushing in. Yeah, and that is in the up internal procedure, much more, as you pointed out, much more visco, much more effective because we know that the amount of visco makes a difference and the up internal approach compared to the up external was aqueous in the anterior chamber. So now we fill, before we do the kind of, uh, catheterization, we start with filling up the AC with some whisk elastic. So, and that allows us to inject much more whisko. We were all afraid at the up external procedure to, to have some decimetolysis at some point some bleeding due to your opening of Schlem's canal or to, to break the, the barrier between Schlem's canal and Destiny. So, uh, but death will never happen with an up internal approach due to the fact that there is visco in the AC. And there's two things. First of all, we, we really pressurize Schlem's canal. We open it really tough. So and next is we, we press out the, the, the visco through the collector channels, and the effect is much higher as I have seen ever in up external approach. So again, it's important. And that, that's a really good point. By pressurizing the eye with viscoelastic during the surgery before we do the canal plastic itself, gives tamponades, it's pushing against the TM from the inside out. So when you then are in the canal viscodilating as well, it's gonna prevent from a decimus attachment occurring. And also by moving it, you're constantly moving the catheter as you're pushing viscoelastic. The only time you ever get a detachment, or I've seen only a couple in my career, which go away within a couple of days. But if it ever happens, it's because you're not moving it. Just staying there, just keep clicking, clicking, clicking. But if you're moving it, it's extremely rare for any of that to happen, which is why we feel much more comfortable pushing more viscoelastic to really stretch it out. And you see viscoelastic coming through the TM into the anterior chamber. You see it dilating the Schlem's canal on OCT, you can see real time, and it going into the episcopal system. So really the entire outflow system as well. So let's see if we can uh, talk about that as well. So this is just another show you again you know, kind of, are we remodeling, kind of what I mentioned before, are we really remodeling this tissue going forward? We kind of talked about that, the, the impact 
of opening the system up early and what does that mean to the natural progression of the disease? And you would say you have good long-term data showing that it's in your clinic, you have good long-term data? Absolutely, yeah. So, and we've learned as earlier we treat as better the results, not only in the same effect of lowering, but in the duration of the effect. And that makes a difference. So again, early intervention, early stage of glaucoma, best results and long lasting results because there is no completely damaged natural outflow. That is a, we all have these patients, bead root eyes, four medications, pressure of 40, and long-lasting history of glaucoma. So if we would had a procedure like this 20 years before, so I'm relatively sure that we can treat these patients 20 years earlier with a, a safe and low invasive procedure, and they would stay stable over 10, 15 years. And, but, so it's a long-life disease. So, But if you give the patient 10 years of drop-free control of the glaucoma, not only the doctor is happy, the patient as well. Compliance and quality of life. I tell you, I now, in my, what has changed so much in glaucoma for me personally, is that I am much more confident and satisfied, even if the pressure is two or three millimeters of mercury higher than when they're on drops, if they're off of drops. Meaning, you have a patient on, let's say, a PGA, a beta block in the morning, and maybe a combination drop, let's say, and the pressure is 13 on that. You do canaloplasty, and they go to 15 or 16 off of medications. I'm much more satisfied with that 16 or 15 than I am with 13 on three or four medications. Good, good point. We all have these patients showing up in our offices with a pressure between 14 to 18, but still progressing. And so and we are always wondering, and I say, okay, why? The pressure is good, but it's still progressing. And we all know the reason. So it is adherence. And you know, of course, any one of you taking any eye drops, PGAs, so it burns like hell. The eye is red. So uh, for, for a lot of good reasons, patients hate drops. So and um, often they take them not to blame us. Oh, yeah. About, so um, if there you is another turn, me. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, not me. So then we add some better blockers that calms the eye a little bit down. But it's not a good idea at the end of the day. And so if we have a safe and effective procedure, why not offering? minimal invasive glaucoma surgery, especially in combination with cataract surgery to our patient. And really, the results are really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's go uh, get through some videos, give you some context. So we'll, we'll have more discussion, of course, on patient selection, our outcomes, how to manage them afterwards as well. But let's just show some videos and, and see what we have here as well. This is actually kind of a cool thing. So I'm just gonna stand back here so I can see, if you don't mind it here a little bit. The reason I want to bring this up to you is we talked about how do we know, what's the evidence that we really are opening up the canal, the TM, and the distal collector channels. This is intraoperative OCT. On the right with that arrow, that is a catheter in there. And as I viscodilate, you can see that circle on the top right getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the idea of this intraoperative OCT is showing us that we are actually enlarging the canal by viscodilating. Uh, look, look at this, nearly one millimeter. And we know Schlem's canal is so that's before with the catheter on the microns, left. Yeah. And on the right is it without the catheter after viscodilation. See how much larger, bigger, circumferentially, how circular that is? That's a viscodilation, not the catheter itself. And then the, up top there, that little arrow, that is the collector system. We could actually see increase in the vena, episcopal vena system, the collector channels enlarging. And the TM, which is right, I'm not sure if I can see an arrow here. The TM right there, that's the TM right there. The TM is now also stretched. So it's thinned out right there, right there, right there. So the TM has gotten thinned out and stretched open. So this is real time evidence. We have a few of these videos now we've done to show real time that viscodilation and the amount of viscodilation does affect how big the canal gets and how much stretching of the TM we see and the episcopal venous system. Now what I can tell you to be fair and balanced is how much equals a better outcome in every patient. That we don't know yet still, but clinically looking objectively at how much we're removing tissue or how much rather we're improving tissue uh, stretching, it is definitely correlated to how much viscoelastic we insert in, as well. So I think that was me out. Im impressive video. So we see it's not only a blinking light going 360 around, there is something happening and there was third to size of a usual Schlem's canal after viscodilation. So, which, which shows me the huge effect. 
excellent video. Congratulations. Oh, no, no, thank you. And, and what's really neat too is we brought a couple of patients back at about six months out. Now it's about six months out to see that there's still dilation. Now it's not the same size to be fair. It's not that big, big circle because viscoelastics washed away, but it is definitely bigger than preoperatively. So we're trying to see how long does that canal stay objectively on OCT open. So we all know uh, routinely it's really hard to identify Schlem's canal and the glaucoma patient also with new OCT devices. Well, if you are able to show there is an open Schlem's canal after surgery, and mostly six months after surgery, shows, yes, there is an ongoing and lasting effect. A lot of fun, a lot of fun here. All right, my friend, this is uh, Dr. Kiyami. Should we let this, let this roll? Mamu Kiyami is one of the, the father figures of uh, Ivaternal Canaloplasty using the eye track catheter. He so, helped and, develop. Uh, yeah, so, and, and by the way, he, you see, that is not done with an eye that, track yeah. advance. Yeah. So, and I was asked, by the way, about seven or eight years ago, there came a guy from iTrek. So I have a video for you, a YouTube video about a new surgical approach. And I've saw the okay, a lot of bleeding, a lot of uh, cutting, a lot of uh, fiddling with some vitreo retinal forceps. And we overcome this issue with this new advanced uh, handle. But elegant surgery as well. And you're going to see here, what you're seeing here is the blanching. This is the red light here coming around. And the red light, you can see all the blanching of the episcleral venous system as he's moving the cat, as, sorry, as he's moving the catheter around. You see the beautiful blanching, the perilimbal blanching of episcleral venous system. Yeah, and staining, that is beautiful. staining as a and, proof. And see the staining there? There is an outgoing flow. So that, that was also viscoelastic with vis vision blue or tripan blue. And you see all that, let me do it one more time. This is just so cool to see here. Let's do it again. So what you see is how much of that vision blue is coming in back into the anterior chamber and how much is basically blanching of the episcleral venous system we see. So that's showing us real-time evidence too that we're seeing not only canal dilation, but pressure going into the episcleral venous system and coming back into the anterior chamber, stretching, causing micro fractures, micro herniations in the TM to open up the TM as well without actually physically cutting the trabecular meshwork as well. That, that is a really cool video to see that as well. Pretty neat. And that's post-op as well, just showing you how quiet the eye is. So pretty neat stuff there as well. Here's another video with, with Dr. Kiyami showing you again that red blinking light. That's the blinking light. And you can see here just the blanching as he's clicking, saying Terry is telling his technician, turn, turn. And look at that nice blanching just there when you do a couple of clicks. That's showing you the amount of force of the visco last, visco delivery into the canal and the episcleral venous system as well. So it's just pretty cool to see that we are doing something even before we do INA. That's just the visco dilation alone. And then he just, this again, with the original eye track, we had to manually feed it. That was one of the limitations, I think. You know, I love the eye track catheter, but I'll tell you, be honest with you, a lot of times I was like, yeah. I don't want to deal with it manually, even though it's, it was a beautiful surgery, but let's be honest with but you. But often you need three hands to manage a problem. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and, uh, it's a beautiful surgery though, beautiful elegant, but is. you had to manually feed it in and then manually retract it back. And that's what we'll talk about with the eye track advanced here. So talk about this and how we took that beautiful, elegant surgery, which did require some manual kind of feeding of the, of the track, eye track catheter to now a loading system to allow more efficiency and I think more consistency. Talk about this. I'm not often talking about game changer, but I think for this procedure, it is a game changer. We have now a handpiece. Uh, you can adapt to the surgeon, surgeon's needs. So uh, you, you can adjust, you can uh, orientate the, the actuator, the slider, the way you like it to do. And uh, so it's, it's strictly one-handed. You have your second hand to control the eye, to place the gun your prism. And that's why the learning curve is this one is really, really short. By the way, we had these mixed masterclass starting the first time at the ESCRS this year. And there were a couple of uh, really ambitious uh, fellows um, and looking or to start with glaucoma surgery. And one of the topics was of internal canaloplasty and they were using, and they have mostly never done a canal-based procedure. So, uh, and they've done the eye trick procedure the first time. But after two attempts, the vast majority, all of them, were able to introduce the catheter 360 uh, in an eye model. So but it's not very different to, to a human eye. So I see a very short learning curve, a highly predictable procedure, and that is what I love so much.
Yeah, I think I think consistency and delivery of the catheter is always have a good view. I, and I can't overemphasize every time I talk to anybody, especially if you haven't done a lot of MIGs yet, take your time. Don't compromise on the view. Even Wednesday when I did a case and Joe was there, you know, he t he saw me take an extra few minutes to kind of get a good view and patient was Ted was not tilted correctly. So I don't do anything until I have a good view. If you don't have a good on fast view where you're perpendicular to the trabecular mesh work, it can be difficult regardless of what MIGS procedure you're doing. So it's the first thing we do. But once you have a good view, I think this does create more of a consistent delivery of the eye track catheter. And what I want to show you here is so this so this this is the nozzle here that allows you to turn. So depending on how you hold it, whether you hold it with your thumb at this, this is called the actuator basically, that slider up there, allows you to advance the catheter. So you can hold it with your like a pencil, you can hold it with your thumb. So how you hold it can depend, and that's why you can turn this nozzle here, and that nozzle you can turn to keep it up. So I'll show you in a second how we want that the lip of the cannula tip to engage the TM. So you can turn it so it's more convenient for your ergonomics and how you hold the uh, actual device. So again, this is the catheter itself. So that's the shaft here. This is the catheter with this red illumination tip, viscoelastic coming out of it. And that's this little edge right here, this little lip here, this little lip or tongue we call it, that allows us to actually engage the trabecular meshwork. Now again, the key is not to push really hard against the TM. What we wanna do is just gently hold it against the TM, angling slightly upward towards it, and just keeping it stable. I think what happens a lot of time, Carson, is that we kind of push really hard against the TM into the scleral wall, and then we have resistance because we're hitting the posterior wall. So kind of just keeping it nice and stable, and that little lip kind of keeps it stable for us. So, uh, yeah, the risk of over, or so too deep implantation, bending the, the catheter. So what I like on this uh, canola, especially, you don't need any second instrument. Opening Schlem's canal is easy. As you mentioned it, pressing down just and pushing slightly forward the catheter. By the way, it's the same as we know from up external procedures. So, and we know it works excellent. Uh, so, but it makes opening a Schlem's canal, addressing Schlem's canal and introducing the catheter into Schlem's canal very, very easy and very controlled. And that gives you time. And I think it is very important to, to point it out. Good view is key. A best orientation, patient's position, microscope position and so but with these handpiece it's easier but yours you can concentrate of the of the status of your vision on the trabecular meshwork you don't have to fiddle with a second instrument or to hold a loose catheter in place using a vitreal retinal forceps which was used hundreds of time by your VR colleague before and that makes it so reliable and, and easy to re re reproduce. And that is, I think, a key in a procedure, the, the high predictability, not only in the results, but in the procedure itself. Very good points, very good points as well. Let's show a video here as well. This is actually one of my videos. I believe this is one showing the importance of the illumination tip. Now, why this is important? Because we don't know sometimes where we are. You do a GAT with an, a suture GAT, you don't know where it goes sometimes. With a blinking light, you can figure it out. So this is just me now. Now what we want to talk about too is we made that paracentesis to enter the eye about three clock hours away from the nasal angle. So I'm going to enter and you see here, there's the view of the, the TM there. So the TM is that nice brown line. So there's a the trabecular meshwork. Now this is a patient here, very good view. I have an onfos view. I'm going to enter with my paracentesis that I made three clock hours away from the nasal angle. And I'm going to engage, sorry about the view, it wasn't that clear here, but you can see I'm going to engage with that lip angling up. Excuse me. Uh, uh but one important point, it's now filled with visco and you see still some reflux bleeding in Schlem's canal. So it's important to fill up the anterior chamber properly, but not to overfill. So a pressure of 30, 40 due to in, uh, injection of viscolathic, in my opinion, is very important. Otherwise, you could be struggling with opening Schlem's canal because we know if the pressure is high, then there is a risk of collapsing Schlem's canal. Excellent video, Paul. Let's show again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. For some reason, I'm not able to adjust it here. But yeah, the bottom yeah, line so, is... It's so wonderful. We can <laughs> see it. We just got to see it over and over, over and, and over, over again. It's so beautiful. <laughs> so I'm just showing you there, though. I'm just having my technician click, click, or turn, turn, turn. That's just showing you how much viscoelastic comes out of the cannula tip or the actual catheter tip. So a good amount of viscoelastic comes out with each turn of the device. Uh, that your technician has. So I'm going to enter here. You see a good on-fast view of the trabecular meshwork and scleral and the spur. Yeah. 
Yeah, you see some heme and some, some pigmentation, some pig, patchy pigmentation there. So I'm entering with my catheter or my cannula tip there, and I'm gonna engage upward fashion. See, I'm about a 50 degree angle upward, and I'm not gonna, I'm not parallel, I'm actually pointing towards the TM about a 30 degree angle, but I'm not pushing too hard, just gently. And there you go, I have a good gel of you, and it's gonna gently advance it. Now I'm advancing, 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 and it looks good. You're gonna see down here, there's a red light, you see the red light come around, but then I lose it. I can't find it. I'm like, it should go around. It goes by pretty fast, actually. But I couldn't see it. I said, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Now, what you always want to do is say, okay, where is it? So I'm going to find here in a second. It's going to be right about there, right there. I'm going to turn the lights down to show you exactly. But why it's important is because as I was advancing it, it wasn't going around to the other side, to the other 180 or 360. It was actually going to an offshoot over here. It's going over there. And so the light told me, hey, you know what? I'm not in the canal still, I've gone to some offshoot as well. So I'm gonna turn the lights down in a second and show you uh, what it is looks like. So there you go, the lights are off, I'm gonna retract it back. I'm in the canal now, I'm gonna re-advance it in a second, and I'm re-advancing it, and it keeps wanting to go out there. So now, Carson, what do we do here? Let's say that happens to you. What, what, do, you, what do you wanna do now? So, a good point, I want to ask this question to you. So, uh, uh, so how, first, how often do you see this? these phenomena it's often every second case not every very uh, not very often honestly yeah. i think majority it's time not it very goes often on. i think not that very is often key message. yeah so uh my approach is first just slightly inject visco to dilate schlem's canal and then nearly 80 percent of the occasion that is fine so it goes through stays in the canal and yes it is very important that's why the light is so useful because you see where you are with your catheter so, and um, if uh, an injection with, of visco doesn't work well, you can turn it 180, do the other direction, and in the really vast majority of all cases, you will be fine with this. You can go anti-clockwise and to, to deal these strictures or false way. Yeah, so in that case you saw, I, I felt pretty comfortable. So as a mild glaucoma patient, mild POAG on one PGA, I felt pretty comfortable. I went over, what, 200 degrees? So I felt pretty comfortable with going back, retracting it, and injecting viscoelastic. I felt pretty good about the outcome that way. But yes, you can either back up on the way forward, inject more viscoelastic to break those herniations, give yourself space to keep going around that blockage, or go back around the other way. As you mentioned, you can actually make a paracentesis on the other side and go the other direction if you want. Or what I just did, just retract it back and complete whatever you completed. So if you're not 360, you're 220, 240, 280, that's okay. We've seen significant efficacy if you're not exactly 360. So I know a lot of doctors get concerned. I could get all the way around, so I didn't do anything. We did a lot, even at 180 so degrees. Don't feel ashamed. Sometimes don't you don't achieve 360. And that's okay. You still have significant, remember, we're addressing a, still a fair number of the collector channels as well. So going back to the kind of steps again, Karsten, if you want to talk about the steps you mentioned earlier, how yeah, what we have to do. important. Uh, placement, talk about the placement. The placement about three clock hours away from the, the point you try to introduce the catheter and not a perpendicular incision, but more tangential. So your main incision, your cataract surgery, what you don't want to use? So I don't use the main incision in, in combined surgery. Very, very important point. So for a couple of reasons. First, it's easier to address the, or, in, or introduce the catheter into Schlem's canal if you are only three clock hours away and mostly my cataract incision is temporarily means six clock hours away then there is a high risk of too steep uh, implantation bending catheter and problems after problems so use your sideboard design of the sideboard should be slightly different to a, a usual sideboard uh, i'm using uh, a bimanual ia so i have always two sideboard but the design is not perpendicular a little bit tangential towards Schlem's canal that makes it very, very easy to control the, your cannula using the paracentesis as a fulcrum. So to adjust it a little bit and to stay stable at the level of trabecular meshwork after opening it and forwarding the catheter. So and anything else, so opening, you pointed it out before, with the tip of the cannula just slightly pressed down, forward your catheter with a slightly angled, upward angle of about 15 to 20 degrees towards the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork. So, but if the catheter is once in, release the pressure a little bit, so, and then forward the catheter again. 
So release the pressure, hold the cannula in place, and then it goes out around without any, any restrictions, with any resistance. So, and then back again, slow down, slow down by, by, by going go back. It can go really fast. It can go really so, fast. So <laughs> uh, there is a one, two ratio. If you push the slide of one millimeter forward, there's a two millimeter way the catheter goes into Schlem's canal and vice versa. If you ask your nurse, give her the chance to turn the wheel fast enough. Otherwise you can retract this catheter in less than a second. But we like a proper filling. So slow down, calm down. I ask my nurse, uh, just start clicking to your own frequency. So and I listen to her and then I adapt my retracting speed with it with a slider, which is very, very easy. And how many turns are you telling your technician per so clock So it depends. Hour? So a good question. It depends on the viscoelastic. My standard visco is uh, Helon GV Pro, and it's about 24 to 30 clicks clock hour. So per clock hour, three clicks usually. So and if you prefer to use Helon Pro, uh, up to 40, 36 to 40 clicks, a little bit more. So you see the, the, the due to the lower viscosity of the Helon Pro, uh, a more outflow throughout the collector channels and then in my opinion there is a it's not a risk but the chance of dilating Schlem's canal very good is a little bit less if, if you use pro compared to GV pro. Yeah so I think about three to four clicks per clock hour I think the key is not to be shy I think we're so used to like click and then you move it another clock hour as Carson mentioned really important to slow down listen to your technician how fast they're clicking because you can go within, you can go like four or five clock hours within like literally one little slide. So that's that's what I think. I think a learning curve that I had to, to get appreciated as well. And then uh, we it's, talked. It's like the Vienna Waltz, yeah. <laughs> one, two, three, one, two, three. Every you get the rhythm after hour. a while. You yeah, get the you rhythm. Have to get the rhythm. <laughs> it's easier for you because you're an excellent musician. I don't know about excellent, <laughs> but I try to be. It. I'm not sure about excellent though. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good point. See, now we're in Vienna, the Waltz. I love it. All right, so I think this is one of my um, vision. Oh my, this is one of my videos on how to get a good view. And this is important because. I think we, we, when we think we have it on FOSS view, we really don't. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you a video here where there's a trabecular metric there. And I, I think that I have a really good view there, right? Carson, I think it's a good view. That's a really good on FOSS view, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. But look when I turn, when I had the head turn. Yeah. So when you turn even a little bit more the head, that's so that this is before I had to, I had to turn the head more or the eye more. And watch what happens when I turned it more, ready? Watch this. Just a little turn more. That is on FOSS. Okay, uh, yeah, and it's only five degrees. It's so subtle, right? But that little bit of more movement gives you the ability for the TM to face you like this versus the, fa versus the TM facing downward. Why that's important? If the TM is facing down like this a little bit, then when you enter with your catheter, your cannula, it's gonna hit the superior wall, right? So you want to be as perpendicular here so you're really truly perpendicular with the entire Schlem's canal so it doesn't hit, go above, up or down. That's the idea why you want it to be as perpendicular as possible. So it's subtle, but that's a little nuance is that if you haven't done MIGS yet, just take your time. Don't be a hero. It's okay to take an extra couple of minutes. Find the amount of tilt of the scope, amount of tilt of the head, how much pressure with your gonio prism, how much viscoelastic you want to put in the eye. All those take some time. Once you get it, it's a lot more efficient. Just initially it can take some time as a learning curve. So this is another video I think of mine here just showing you kind of an entire procedure and kind of just a straightforward procedure, but good way to kind of give you some context. So that's the back end of the device. That is where the attachment goes to the box. There's a white, there's a white box that has the illumination power for it. And that also connects to the viscoelastic device to turn, right, the device there. This is the main shaft, the main body of the iTrack Advance as well, just showing you the back end there. And the technicians will prime it, will flush the viscoelastic through the system before you start. And that that's the front there, that's the nozzle. That's where you can turn, again, depending on how you want to hold it. And that's the tip there. That little tip has a, the, the actual lip that we talked about. And then I'm going to do is I'm going to advance the catheter there with my slider. You can see what it looks like there. So I'm showing you the slider and how it advances. This is kind of a general idea of the, the device. So I'm having the technician click. I say turn, turn, turn. And you can see how much viscoelastic is coming out of that cannula tip. So it's a good amount. We really are pushing a good amount of viscoelastic. This was Helon Pro, not Helon GV, as you can tell. So I'm gonna go ahead, I made my paracentesis already, and I have, a, I have an on fast view there, not a very heavily pigmented TM, but you can see the TM fairly well there. So I'm gonna go and enter through my paracentesis, I made about three, 
before clock hours away. And again, I'm not actually pushing too hard. I'm just going to gently hold it there and it's going to put a little pressure again, aim, aiming upward. Lights on, it's going to advance it. And you see how it just slides in the canal. It's going to go through the path of least resistance. Keep advancing it. Keep advancing it here. You see it's going to come around and you believe it or not, you have to slow down. Because I had to slow down and stop. And I was like, wait, where is it? It's almost already to the other side. There it is. It's already now to the other side. And I had to, break, I had to slow down and it still was that fast. So it's a very efficient surgery. And so now that we're around the other side, I'm going to retract back. And now I'm going to tell my technician, okay, go ahead and start to turn with that little device on the other side to release viscoelastic. And what you're going to see here in a second is some blanching on these areas here. And at the end, I'll show you also. But I'm retracting back. I'm saying turn. Turn, turn, turn. I can see the red light on the right side there. Turn, 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 turn. That's my cadence. So I'm getting like three clicks or three turns per clock hour. Turn, turn. And you see how it's kind of getting white at the limbus here? It's all white down there. All that is blanched. All that is blanched just from visco dilation. That's it. And now I'm seeing come to the other side. I'm saying turn, 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 and we come out and we're done. And that's real time. No editing there as well. And you can release it. Oh, my favorite. You can see some blanching here. Watch this. Ready? Watch that arrow there. Ready? Three, two, one. Come on. Isn't that awesome? I love it. I can geek out all day on that. It's so much fun to see that. But that's the idea. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, I think it's something that well, I tell people to slow down because also if you push and you have a resistance and you push too hard, it can kink. Have you have that happened to you so, where I push too uh, hard? And, and uh, first of all, congratulations. Excellent video again. And uh, it's not only controlled surgery, but it's a controlled defect. During surgery, C. Okay, collect the channels, it's open, there is a blanching. So uh, that gives you a high confidence in that what you're doing. I think very controlled and, and so uh, really great. That shows all the benefits of this procedure. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty fun, pretty fun to do it. And so, you know, if you do want to slow down, because if you go too hard, you hit resistance, back up, push more viscoelastic. Because if I, if I push it too hard sometimes, it'll kink a little bit there. So that's why I like to make sure that we slow down as you're advancing that slider as well. I think you have one case here. Is this your case? That was my, as far as I remember, standalone procedure. You okay, can do perfect. it as standalone talk as well. Talk about that before we start. Talk so, about standalone. Uh, uh, and then we should talk about patient population. Yeah. As long as the angle is open. And yes, I prefer to address up and turn the canaloplasty as early as possible. But we have a couple of patients underwent cataract surgery years ago, now under one, two medications, not very well controlled, uh, but, but more or less stable, not, not fast progressing. And I think these patients are very good candidates for doing standalone abinternal canonoplasty. And uh, so let's, let's have a look on the video. So uh, two parathrontesis to be sure to wash out the visco at the end of the procedure really properly. Otherwise, there is a low risk of pressure spikes post-op. That's why wash it out. And I'm using, as I mentioned before, by manual. You see the different approach. I'm a strictly right-hander, so more tangential incision to introduce the eye. Filling of viscoelastic, I think, a very important step. Fill it properly, but don't overfill it. You see the, the iris diaphragma goes only slightly down, which shows you, okay, the AC is completely filled, but not overfilled. So, and again, vision is key. We've learned from, from your video. So use the gonio prism of your choice, it's up to you. There are no limitation, but vision. What, what gonio prism are you using? So I don't know, don't ask me. <laughs> so uh, a standard one, yes. Standard uh, one, okay. <laughs> That's uh, the Cathena one, I think. Yeah, so previously primed catheter. Nice. Look at that, yeah, really look at high that. pigmented trabecular meshwork. So uh, it's a pseudo exfoliation case. I think they are suitable for ab internal canaloplasty as well. Uh, as long as the trabecular meshwork is not too destroyed, you should avoid to do these on neovascular or uveitic patients because we know. There are secondary changes at trabecular meshwork and stretching is not enough. That is now a time loop which shows you how easy it is. So at this moment, I introduce the catheter into Schlem's canal. It's nearly two millimeter gone. And then I try to release the pressure. We have seen in your video as well. So uh, that lowers the resistance. 
that lowers the kinking of the catheter and makes it easier to introduce these catheter into Schlemm's canal. But again, also in a highly pigmented trabecular meshwork, you have very good control with your gonioscopic view. So turning around, you can remove the, uh, the, the gonio prism and uh, try to visualize. The light is a little bit too bright in this uh, situation, but you see within a, a couple of seconds, uh, the, the red light will show up in front of the, over there. Now we are 360 and now start returning, returning, returning. And you see the modification, the Schlems canal is not always at the limbus directly. It differs a little bit. So, and now look at how powerful I inject viscoelastic. That is not because of break of trabecular meshwork. That is because of the stretching of Schlems canal. And that pushes out the visco outside the, the, uh, um, the AC without decimetolysis. And that shows me safety and how powerful the stretching process is. Removing visco and... Uh, so what we see in this case is not a severe... You see a slight blanching. So, uh, but I don't overfill the eye with BSS now, overpressurize. Because with higher magnification, you see these segmented blood aqueous or blood uh, viscofill in the collector channels. So, and that are all open collector channels. You can see the, the segmentation. So that is what I'm aiming for first. Yeah, that's great. That is great. And then you see some areas are white, more white, some are not. Some are some of the vessels no, are no, exactly yeah, yeah. broken in the, some the, patients. Yeah, not broken, so but open. You have in a some. blanching effect, but it's not so severe um, compared to a procedure where you do it only open trabecular meshwork and then inject with um, uh, BSS. So there is a higher blanching effect, but a local one we see here 360 opening of collector channels. Now, I'm just gonna back up after this is done, because you, did you score the team a little bit? Did you, use a, did you use a tip to kind of open it up a little bit? That's kind of cool too. Do you do that as well? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna rewind it back here again, and I'm gonna show you. So when you, um, when you went into the eye, and then you, with your cannula tip, did you score it first? Kind of open the TM a little bit there? Um, with the, with the, uh, with the tip of the cannula. Yeah. So or you only press it down. So press it down, okay. Or, or it's a slight movement from non-pigmented to pigmented okay, down, okay. mesh work. It's not a real cutting. Sure. It's not sharp, sharp enough. But Can to be kinda... sure that you're at the right level, because we know uh, there is a, a pigmented, a non-pigmented part of the trabecular meshwork, and you went and drop in the center of Schlem's canal. That's why the slight movement from above down to sclerous ball. Now, do you want to mention why we aim up a little bit there? So, uh, because yes, you pointed it out before. So we want to end up inside Schlem's canal not to press the catheter against the superior wall of Schlem's canal. Then there will be stick, uh, a risk of sticking in and uh, bending the, the catheter. And the, the catheter itself is really delicate. So and if it wants king, then it could be challenging to introduce again into Schlem's canal. Good point. So I'm just going to see if I can just show this one more time here. Because I like, I like the beautiful TM. You can see it's so nice. You can see it here. So, so you're angling upward to upward and you're aiming so, towards and, the TM. As a far bit as I remember, it was my second case with That's the great. new I love it. eye track advance. And you see also in the hand of a not as skillful surgeon as you. Oh, stop. It you're works like, fine. So <laughs> this is great. No, this is a great video. Yeah, see, yeah, it's so a motivation now. video for other colleagues. So uh, <laughs> no, but it's learning great. cough. It's if great. I can do it, you can do no, it as well. That's great. That's great. There's so aiming, aiming upward. I love that. It's a great, great view there as well. Nicely done. All right, well, let's talk about it. We have, I think, just about a few minutes left. So thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Let's just talk about patient selection, so maybe some pearls uh, post-op, how to manage as well before we end here. Um, talk about, so you mentioned standalone and cataract both. Do you do a, a number of standalones or is it mostly with cataracts? Uh, so the, the majority of my patient is combined. So nevertheless, but I trust these surgical approach. And as I mentioned out before, mild to moderate glaucoma and not high progressing, medication limited to three medication, I will address a uh, standalone procedure for these patients as well, because I've seen excellent results. And we've, we, we were talking about these issues of adherence again, side effects, dry eye disease. We all know from our glaucoma uh, patients. And, and, and really, 
nearly 80% of my standalone procedures. So patients are off drops if you sec uh, select the right patient. It's not uh, an uncontrolled pressure of 35 under four medication. Okay, that needs another kind of procedure. But two medication, more or less controlled, not very fast progressing. I think it's a perfect candidate. We were talking about the 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 anatomy of the of the trabecular meshwork, of course, open angle, and no secondary changes, but we have a wide range of patients we can address to of internal canaloplasty. What's your opinion? Yeah, I think very similar to that as well. I mean, the, I think if you have an open angle with a secondary open angle pigmentary suit exfoliation, steroid induced primary open angle glaucoma, I think we have a number of patients who could qualify. And again, because it's so minimally invasive and it helps the whole conventional optical system, you can use it in combination with GAT, with stenting, with cutting, whatever you need to do as well. So I, I kind of use it as a combination a lot with other procedures too, if I need to. But if I have a younger patient, who like the same thing. My goal is not that they're so uncontrolled pressures of 40 on four meds, but they're decently controlled, but they're not happy taking three or four medications. Let's say they're phakic. I feel very comfortable doing a procedure like this to help reopen the conventional pathway and not leave anything behind, not worried about having to have a secondary surgery in the future, keeping those options open. So I would say to those patients who are, let's say, non-compliant, and, and there's so many patients don't complain about it to our face, but they may say, doc, my vision comes and goes. I have a hard time seeing throughout the day that's basically dry eye. Or they don't even remember the color of their top, of their PGA. If they don't know the top, or they don't know the color, after being on a PGA for 10 years, they're not compliant, right? So there's a number of reasons why patients don't take their meds. So I, I pay attention to that now. And I have my staff also pay attention to those risks or those kind of key uh, kind of nuggets from patients that indicates they're not compliant. If they see that, they'll tell me, hey, Dr. Paul, this patient I don't think is compliant. Then I'll come and talk about that more. And then talk about, hey, let's try to get you off of one or two medications such an impact on the ocular surface, on long-term disease progression as well. So I like to do it early on in those patients, and then later on, if I have to do a cataract combination, I can redo it again if I had to, or do a stenting or do some cutting later on if they have a cataract surgery. Pseudophaky patients, many people who, let's say, had cataract surgery 10, 15 years ago, and we didn't have all these big procedures, those are patients who are back on drops, very good candidates to say, let's just go ahead and why do we have to make these patients suffer on drops forever and ever where we can get them off of even one medication can be a significant impact as well. You are absolutely right. Reducing medication or in the best case, stopping medication at all makes a happy patient, really. So good vision, better vision, stable vision, a more compliant patient. Patients follow up us because they're okay, they trust us, but they had an expectation and the expectation grows up since the introduction of mix. And uh, so with these approaches, we can fulfill patients' expectations much better than 10 years before. The tw what do we love about cataract surgery? The 20 happy patient, right? Well, you know how to get a glaucoma patient happy? Get them off the meds. <laughs> they don't care about the pressure. They care about getting that drop. Not to worry about the drop every day. Um, I know we're... All right. Well, Carson, good job, man. Paul, good job fun. as well. Yeah, no, really interesting topic. Yeah. So uh, a great partner to discuss such a good approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you, uh, Nova, as well. Thank Appreciate you very that. much. Thank for you.